We are about six years old. We decided to we started with rural youth, but there was a shake up. We'll talk more about that. We, we after a year we focus entirely on disability. We work only in disability inclusion. Um, we work with the job with a with a disabled youth who's aspiring for a job in, in providing him necessary skills to enter a workplace. We work in inclusion by working with the corporates in preparing the workspace to to include a person with disability companies to transform their institutional practices and systems and devices to become accessible physically as well as inclusive socially. And finally, we are also modestly trying to improve quality of learning outcomes in all people with disabilities in schools, and specifically when we work with deaf children in schools. So these are the four areas of our work and we are looking forward to more learning from each other in this session. Great. So, um, I'll go to Manchu, we would like to take a few minutes to tell about yourself, how we got started and, and what, you know, in a high level, what we does. Okay. So, uh, to be honest, when I was uh, asked to speak on this disability thing, I was a bit surprised. But then if I, if I explore the work of Moon, because we never thought about it, to be honest. We never, I think one of the things which Moon does is we do not discriminate like trigger or disabled kind of stuff. So, we have a lot of people with uh, different disabilities in the organization. I talk about it later. Uh, we primarily work on the issue of clothing. You know? Because years back we just raised a very small issue and said we talked about three basic needs which food, cloth, and shelter. And then you suddenly ignore the clothing part, clothing you only remember when a disaster happens. Or it's a highly charitable subject object. So when you say it is a basic need, how come it is not a part of development issues? I mean, you have 100, 150 issues from domestic violence to global warming, you will never find clothing even written in the subject. In, the, in a country like India, more people die due to lack of clothing in winter than after paper flat. If you, today we don't have time for that, but if you go on the presentations or, or the lectures you know, on, uh, on YouTube or website of Google, you'll find all those figures. I mean, it is started, let's say about 16 years back, when I met with a person, uh, that's just one of the story, which is important just to tell you the gravity of the issue. Uh, when I met this person whose full time job was to pick up unclaimed dead bodies for Delhi police outside a LGBT hospital in Delhi. And when I, because I was very keen on writing and photography with them, I am from IMC, studying journalism and all. And then when I spent about a week with this particular person, uh, morning uh, from Betty till late, two statements came up which will tell you the reality of the self. One when Habib, this person said that in winters his work goes up and many times he has so much of work that he cannot tell him. And to my utter surprise, every 24 hours he was picking up red to 12 red bodies. Just in the range of 4 to 5 kilometers where he was able to take a picture. Then he, and summers the average used to be 4 to 5. He had a little daughter, Tanis, uh, who gave the most shocking statement in Hindi. She said, he did not get under fear. So, I was like, 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 when I feel cold, I hug the dead body and sleep. It does not cover me, it does not cover me. This is a non issue. When I speak about the civil, I talk about the non issues. Now, you can imagine in a country like India or worldwide, as I said, there are 150 issues. Clothing is still not an issue. More people die due to lack of clothing. Not only in Britain, it is not only a you know, weather related issue, it is also a dignity related issue. So now, the way we are approaching it and why, uh, you know, we said about the trash or the economy and all, we are not distributing this more than 1000 tons of material every year as a charity. It is going with a development resource where we are taking a very large scale development work right from building road to taking a pond to taking a van in the villages. And then instead of money, people are getting cloth utensils for fear, all kind of second and material. So basically, the oldest form of charity, the oldest subject object of charity which is the old material primarily crop, we are just trying to, or rather we have moved it out of charity, it has become a development resource. That's why a couple of years back when NASA US State Department, they told us that one of the game changing innovations worldwide, that it has come out that it is the genesis of the parallel economy, which is not cash based, which is trash based. Now to come on this particular subject. I think my grudge is that whenever we talk about inclusion or we talk about enabling and all, we talk about people, we talk about communities, we talk about monetary.
happening and all that. Within the community, we do not talk about the issues. Let me touch upon one very important subject here. While working on cloth, one of the very huge gap area we found was the need of this sanitary pad. Because we said that every single woman across the globe needs a piece of cloth, which is called sanitary pad. If you do not have access to cloth, from where and how you bring that piece of cloth? 2004, 2005, till 2004, 2005, even if you go on Google, you type sanitary pad, sanitary napkin, all kind of tampons and cloths used to come. Not even a single major research in India, no problem is there, no solution. This is the country where you have the largest number of SSGs, microfinance, all kind of inclusion. You know, Angarwadi's health initiatives, everywhere the target is women, nowhere we speak about sanitary pad. When we started traveling, I'm forward to speak because there's no mic. Okay. When we, when we started traveling across the country, we found that they dirt, use the dirtiest piece of cloth because for them it's a synonym of dirt. They wash it, they cannot dry it in sunlight. Now, whatever I am saying, just keep imagining in perspective of a person who is the person for whom we are talking in this particular panel. I will give you a very shocking detail just after, you know, just in a minute. So, they, they cannot wash it. They cannot dry it in sunlight and we found if you have two to three women in the family, the cycles are different, they are sharing the same reason. We further found that it is also shared within the village by many, many women. Millions of women in the same thing, rather million is a small word in the crores of women in India, are actually using things like sand, ash, juke, dhani mat, dhani katukla, bori katukla, the child bearing age is actually happening because of this particular lack of cloth. 88% of Indian women do not have access to sanitary pad. That's the research in recent research. This is what I'm talking about, knowledge. One thing which we did, we said that if people like us are going through these problems, especially at the time of menses, menstruation, we have never thought about the issues of the people who have any kind of physical or mental challenge. We went to Baba Ante Rashtra, which is, which is like a family of us, so many inmates, thousands of people stay there of all kind of disability. Just in my last sentence, so that you start thinking about these non-issues for this almost you know, different kind of community, the blind woman, the blind girl often does not even know that she is down. She knows blood is red, she does not know what is red. Any kind of physical disability where you have to change, you need pieces of cloth. We have cases, not only there, in many other parts when we started working on this particular segment of the society. When a lady like this, who is down, sleeps, she at least wears two or three layers of any kind of cloth. So that it does not trouble her caretaker. She does not tell her caretaker that I am down and I want to change. And imagine, we are talking about every single girl, every single woman who has any kind of disability. Many of you must be working in this sector. And I am pretty sure when, I, you know, when we have explored it further, there is hardly any talk about it. More later, thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Mario Bellini. Uh, I work for a social enterprise based in the United States called RIT. And around five or six years ago, um, Myself and my co-founders were students at a university at MIT in Boston. And we had done a project to improve wheelchairs in East Africa. And we were making small improvements to existing wheelchairs there to make them more appropriate for the environment. And what we realized after doing this for several months is that what was needed in many developing countries was an entirely new kind of wheelchair. Something that wasn't designed for hospitals, but designed for the rough conditions that many people face in rural villages. Many of the rural villages of which I'm sure you are familiar with or your organizations are familiar with. Regular hospital wheelchairs we found were too hard to push. You couldn't use them on the dirt road. Uh, when they broke, there were not spare parts available so that you were stuck without any mobility at all. And the people that were faced with these chairs didn't have the independence they needed. They ended up entirely dependent on their family, and this caused a lot of stigma and hardship for them. 
So we went and studied biomechanics to see if we were to come up with a whole new kind of wheelchair, how it would be propelled. We looked at many different mechanisms, ultimately decided on this lever drive that you can by pushing on the lever. This gives you a lot more leverage. It makes it easy for you to go over difficult terrain like hills and mud. And if you grab at the base of the lever, it's kind of like your top gear. You can move almost twice as fast as a regular wheelchair on tarmac without any extra effort. So as students, we did some field studies. We studied in Kenya, and Tanzania, Uganda, and Guatemala, and kept testing new versions of the chair. And ultimately, we ended up with a chair that wheelchair riders around the developing world were very happy with. So two or three years ago, we partnered with Jaipur Foot, uh, BMBSS, to do a, a larger field trial in Rajasthan and tested around 100 chairs across Rajasthan in all sorts of different terrains to see how well it worked for people with disabilities in India. We spent the next year adjusting the design, adapting it to the local needs, and also setting up a manufacturer, a contract manufacturer in Indore, Madhya Pradesh, uh, to start to make the chairs at a larger scale. Last year, we've shipped about 1,200 of these chairs and are on track to do three to 5,000 or so this year across India and around the developing world, particularly in West Africa and South America. But this is a project uh, that has been started as a student project then turned into kind of an engineering project of how we can refine a product for the needs of uh, people in rural villages across the world. And then it's become more of a humanitarian social enterprise project of how can we partner with local organizations, how can we partner with government agencies and NGOs to really reach the scale that we need to make an impact. Thank you. So, so speaking on the same thread of, of scale up, right? So, you know, the whole conference is about scaling, right? You start with a small idea, but you don't want to be a small, small idea. You want to be, you want to pass the lives of millions of people, right? So, my, what is your biggest challenge, right? You know, in, in taking this idea and and making it into an innovation which will touch the lives of hundreds of millions of people. What what are the top two challenges you face? Um, it seems that everything is a challenge. Uh, our top challenges are, first, how can we develop the partnerships that we need to get this into the field? This is about $200, 10 or 11,000 rupees, which compared to other wheelchairs produced and sold in India, is actually very competitive in price. But what we found is that it does not matter how much the wheelchair costs, the person who is ultimately using the chair is almost never able to pay for it. It's always given as a donation from a government organization or an aid agency. And so our first big challenge is how do we inform them about ourselves and about our product? And how do we convince them that this lever technology and repairability that this chair has, uh, if it truly benefits the person that's using it, how do we convince them that it's worth 10 extra dollars per chair? How can we convince someone who's just a bureaucrat or someone in a higher level international organization that they will truly get more of an impact? The people that are using the chair are keen supporters of it, but they're not the ones that are paying out of pocket for the chair. Our second challenge is on the supply side. How can we take something that was designed to be made in small quantities in rural villages and make it cost effectively at high quality and high volume, and do so in a way that we can trust that it will show up and people will know how to use it, know how to start taking advantage of its benefits right away. I can't travel you know, all over West Africa to make sure that the 800 people there using the chair were each trained in how to use it. So how do we establish systems and partnerships so that the people who end up with the chair or are using it in the field are able to take full advantage of it? and uh, maximize for empowerment. You know, if you notice, right, the first problem we talked about, which is the people who use it are different from the people who pay for it, is actually a pretty common problem in many, many things. Right? For example, men's clothing, the biggest buyers of men's clothing is actually women, especially e-commerce. Right? 
eighty percent of men's clothing online is purchased by women. So, so there is some synergies with that. Mahesh, I want to kind of pick on you on the same uh, on the same thread, right? I mean, Samarthanam is about scale. I mean, reading one line from your brochure, it's basically your efforts have touched the lives of thousands of people living with disabilities. But obviously, you didn't start with thousands. You started with one, five, ten, hundred, whatever the number is, right? What were your two biggest problems? Just maybe two or whatever. In scale, what 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 was it that that made you? Yeah, two major major problems. One is get yeah. quality manpower to quickly scale. Sometimes retaining them is another challenge. And we like to do both in one. And the second one is mindset. Mindset of uh, people with disability, their parents. When you go to the meet location, convincing them, talking to them about that always becomes a big challenge. So to solve that, sometimes we work with local partners. But the two major challenges I feel is key uh, human resource and the people who take benefit from them. As Mario said, uh, people who get the benefit, sometimes they don't, they don't pay for it, so they don't realize the value. So, switching stacks a little bit because if you look at Raja and, uh, uh, and Anshu have a little bit of a perspective where they are actually enabling, uh, enabling the disabled to find jobs, right? So, if I were to ask you Raja, what are the two biggest challenges? You know, just take a little bit, let's, let's play a little bit of a devil's advocate here. Take a little bit of a view of a corporation, right? And, and, and Anshu, uh, you know, good as an employer. What are the two biggest challenges you have seen in, in, in absorbing uh, a disabled uh, employee? Um, first, I mean, uh, we are, it took us a little while. We had the conviction that what we were offer there is a value for, for the consumers, the client and the service. But value realization and the, the translation of the value into a fee takes a time. Takes time uh, because the whole I mean, everybody's important, but to build the confidence and to see that there is value, if, if, if the job seeker comes to me, he comes, he doesn't want it, he doesn't really want my training, he really wants a job. And so he get, takes my training and the training is loading into a job, uh, there is a time time. And, to, and, and if, I, if I'm serving a set of people, I have to create those, those many jobs to happen. So as so the power of two the power of more of more of all the kicking and and to make it viable one to one months for eight one batches. Now coming to a corporate uh, I'm sure it's quite right? so I'm sure it's much easier to handle this. But I've had um, I had employers who will tell me, hey, uh, first you are saying I should take a person with something. That means I'm already doing your favor. <laughs> then you are asking me to pay for it? Come on. Yeah. And if, and if I tell you that I charge them to live with or the, with the lives of people with disabilities, you make, you make money with the, with the, with the, uh, the lives of people with disabilities, come on, I'm not going to see you at all. I mean, I've had conversations go to that extent. So it takes, it, again, a whole thing and a mindset, which is uh, you know, breaking various barriers uh, in, uh, in corporate uh, because of our society is not being used. So, in a sense, uh, we are faced with the baggage of, um, of fighting what the society has left as not for not. If we all had gone to school with, 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 uh, with, a, with a student who was disabled, I mean, I wouldn't have, you know, have been uh, having these, these kind of battles to face. So, so those again are the challenges. But at the end of the day, I can say there's a lot of hope. These challenges get broken. There are, you know, there's a huge opportunity to break. Breakthrough and make a significant, you know, uh, sustainable, um, you know, uh, both impact in terms of both uh, social impact, clear social impact, lives uh, gets changed, you know, the um, whole, uh, you know, family gets, uh, you know, completely transformed after the job, plus, you know, the financial impact uh, can happen. This is possible. So, yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I? Yeah. I think till the time we, we consider this a part of CSR is all about. I think that's the most important part. You know? That means we are actually not treating people in a decent manner, in a dignified manner. I, I feel offended, even to be honest, when uh, so-called 
disabled person is only and only called in a conference to talk about disability. Just see this trend everywhere. Why a so called disabled person cannot speak on economics, on management, on any other subject? Why only that person only has to talk about disability? I, I because, because that's our mindset. That's our mindset. I will I'll give you one very small example. You know, uh, Shanti Ragman is a friend uh, who is working in Bangalore, you know, with the visually challenged people. And we do this collection campaigns uh, on Sundays. Uh, we did one campaign with Shanti where the visually challenged people actually organize the camp, completely they organize the camp. So in the initial phase of this, we used to go door to door to talk about the issue uh, of the clothing and why it is needed and all that. But we used to make sure that we will not pick up the, the effort of the people have to come and bring it at a, at a particular place. Now, just see, again the mindset. The moment you see a visually, visually challenged, I'm sorry, but you know, this is how unfortunately the country operates. The moment you see a visually challenged person knocking your door, you have absolutely different aspect. Either this person has, has come to sell some duster or some, some product or some candle and it's always accompanied by someone. Now, so many people, that's what we started, so many people in that particular camp started offering something. Very proudly these people, these volunteers said that we are not here to ask for something. We are here to inform you about something. There is a camp, we are volunteer to organize a cloth collection or whatever huge camp. This is the camp at your door. Please come and drop it. You should actually, whatever happened with the residents, that's a different issue. The most positive part happened with the volunteers. Who always thought that we were never, our skills, our talent, our that choice was never utilized for something else. But out there, there was a, there was a totally different opportunity. So I think this is something like many new kind of stuff which is happening and that's why there is no inclusiveness to the office. You know, I think what the contrast is the government is a very different example, right? Let's say any anybody wants to ask the world's best thought thought leader on what will happen if aliens from outer space invade the earth. Do you know who they'll go to? There's a person called Stephen Hawking. And and I, I think he's uh, he, he's really challenged. I mean, I don't know, could you describe what his exact challenge is? I mean if you don't. Yeah, I think uh, it's a list of the yeah. so, so, yeah. so people reach out to them not because of anything else that is mentioned, but for his subject matter and his knowledge and his expertise. I think that is like really where we want to be. But how many people get a chance to reach that level? Yeah. You can imagine you can count one person and for everything he is mentioned. In this country of or rather world of billions of millions of people and different kind of issues. So we talked a little bit, I know, uh, before I open this to the audience, I just want to ask you one, one more question. You know, we talked about the view from an employer's perspective, right? But in, in getting a good career, there's two attributes to it. One is training them, another is finding an employer who has the training. What are some of the big challenges? In, in providing disabled people with the best possible training that anyone can aspire for, whether it's online or offline, because the world of training is changing right now. It's not the same as it was like 10 years back. What are some three big challenges that are that are there in the, the world of training? Anyone? Yeah, anyone who wants to So, uh, so uh, you know, we come at a point, you know, almost uh, the Kind of school, he finishes his uh, you know, 10th grade, 12th grade, and probably you know, then, then finishes grad, and that's when we come. He will still be a, um, I would say, lack of basic skills by the time you know, they are 10th and 12th. You know, because you know, all you know, the, the, the tools that we talked about are, might be up to I mean, I was in a session on education, and that might become slightly more common. So there is hardly any inclusive system in education in schools happening. Uh, there is no inclusive school. There is in the entire country there are a couple of schools which are, which are reasonably inclusive. There is no inclusive schools. So, so the, the, there is severe um, uh, lack of uh, basic skills. Uh, even before they come to you know, Samantha or 
विशेष और मेरे को ले गया और तीन ऑपरेशन वर्किंग टूवर्ड्स द पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू तो देयर आर फंडामेंटल चेंजेस दैट नीड टू बी मेड मोर एट द पॉलिसी लेवल बाय द प्लेयर्स एक्सेट्रा टू मेक इट रियली रियली चेंज इफ यू रियली वांट यू नो इन अदर थिंग टू वर्क द अदर थिंग्स हैव टू स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द स्कूल एज अर्ली एज
you know, if you would have asked me about the challenges, the, the biggest challenge in urban India is the mindset of people, people like us. In rural India, the mindset of opinion leaders. Opinion leaders, which are the NGO heads and all, who think it is not important and NGOs are also dominated, whether it is male or female, it has the same mindset of this particular subject. I, this is what you know, we have been arguing for the last many years, that why do we call it a human issue? Why don't we call it a human issue? That's the whole issue. This is the same country which was distributing free condoms everywhere, right from STD boot to PDS system and this and that. And if you talk about the sanitary pad or anything to do with the sanitary pad, no, not even a single village heart has that, which has every single material to do with the women and which is the most accessible market to the, to the rural women. Even the richest farmers, wife or sister do not have access to something because in that village heart it is not there. Any, any small shop or PHC, even on the payment the sanitary pad is not there. It is just, just the same thing which you just said. It is the culture of shame and silence and we need to break it. That's why this issue has become so big. It is not the responsibility of the women, for sure. I have a question. You know, you asked them a lot about the challenges. Can we get examples of how the challenges were overcome? So basically a positive bent to all the all the negatives sure. that we've heard of so far. So someone from your of can give yes. us examples of those. Yes. That'd be great. So what were some of the how you know what were your three takeaways which you learned through working through the hoops which helped you overcome the challenges? And earlier, especially you and Mahantesh talked about the two key challenges in I didn't ask you the same question because I slightly different the question. So you had some some big challenges in scale up, but you you talked about the challenges. But if you were to brainstorm on solutions, right, so that the audience can take away like three secret sauces in the back packet, how what would be the key challenge? What would be the key solution spaces to overcome growth barriers? The barriers that I face in face of the rural companies in this thing, and I sell the concept of high numbers in this thing. How we overcome it, they are not ready. They were not, not many were ready to pay for, for the services. There was hardly any when we started. So we said, okay, we had complete faith in the in our service. We knew that this individual, like what they really said, are ready to you know, stop the work, workplace and perform as individuals. And they are, they are good. Our trainers all are very, very confident. And they will much they will be rock stars in the workplace. So we said, okay, please hire them. Will you hire them? Let me not be a barrier now for a moment. Please hire them. Look, look at them if if they go on and work with you for three, you know, HR has three month retention, six month retention, etc. etc. So look at them at three months. If they if they stick around, they produce or they perform as good as anybody else, then you please consider paying us. So they sign up. So it is a, I, it's like anything anybody else, you know, I, I buy a client. You know, so in a way I was buying a client to get it, get get my clothes there. So they, then I found clearly, you know, clear all the business needs are being met. Higher higher very, very, very high retention levels, good good uh, you know, productivity, diversity at, at both places naturally uh, you know attracts many other you know, it actually it is it, it, it improves productivity of the entire team. That, that's one way, you know, these are many such approaches were used in, in engaging a client, showing, you know, there's another approach say, okay, let, please take it for, take this individual for two weeks, no work trial, you will be convinced. Uh, 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 and most of them have, you know, apprehensions of how do we work with them, they feel the awkwardness of how do we say, it's okay to say, see you to a right person, how do we, you know, what will happen, so many things are blocked walk their mind and they stop need the job just to look at the ability of the future. You know, hiring or directing, please look at them. So we we engage and try to uh, you know, get them to what they're supposed to be doing. Um, in terms of working with individuals, um, the, I think it's very important to keep um, you know, doing this, the value, keep providing value, persevere with providing value and I'm sure once the value is seen, uh, it, it does uh, reflect. So for example, when we work with uh, deaf people, 
um, you know, we are also working in a sector where government is providing free services, you know, training services, which may be substandard. And, and there are many NGOs also not providing good quality. Some of them uh, uh, provide very good quality service, but there are many NGOs who not provide substandard. So very much lower fee. So they, I mean, there needs to be a strong resistance from this group, which which will come. They will, I mean, they'll have people come and say, tell me. Um, you know, why do you charge me? Why do you want to do this? So this is good. You know, I mean, for not a disabled individual for a deaf person. So, so there was a resistance. We did face, my team members face resistance. You know, September 26th, there's a deaf march which happens at the in the in, uh, Chennai. My, 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 one of my team members wanted to go and talk about you know, our services, etc. But she said, no, you're not allowed to come. You are, you, are, you, are, you are a corporate, you are making money, so you did not come. But we had. Luckily, at that point in time, we had five or six deaf people who were you know, working in very suboptimal jobs, who we could pick, train, and get them mainstream. Uh, you know, they were accountants, so they got a job as an accountant in the bank and processing, processing data and very good quality salaries. So they came and said, "No, they are you know good, you know charge me service, but I didn't I didn't get you know what I wanted." Which gave me value, which gave me what I wanted, made, made my call, my skill meet, you know, my aspirations. So, and when they, their voice came up, you know, we had to break those barriers too. So, uh, I, will, I mean, we attend, and if your condition is with what value you are providing, uh, you know, people are going to be the consumer in gold, it will be from a beneficiary, they will convert to a consumer, and eventually they will convert to a customer. Sure. So, uh, Mario, uh, I guess speaking on the same line as the question, right? Some positive stories or you know, your product touches the lives of lots of people, right? Tell us some really great story of someone who did something with your product which they couldn't do otherwise. Sure. Uh, so one of the people that we met during our uh, field trial in Rajasthan was a man named Ashok. And he uh, lives in rural Rajasthan and fell from a tree and sustained a spinal cord injury. And so he was sent home in a wheelchair, uh, much like the kind that you are used to seeing in hospitals, the you know, standard push chair. In fact, there are a couple by the reception here. Uh, with that chair, he was unable to go to work. Uh, his uh, tailoring business, which he was running, uh, was forced to close because he could not go the one kilometer to the office in the chair. So as a result, he had to close his business and became dependent on his extended family. So we distributed the chairs throughout Rajasthan with uh, Jaipur Foot that summer. Uh, 100 individuals received chairs. The next day after Ashok received the LFC, he was able to ride the one kilometer to his office entirely by himself and reopen the business. Kind of a similar story, a uh, woman, I think her name was Clara, in Haiti, uh, was able to use the chair to go to school by herself for the first time. And when we followed up with her, uh, we were surprised at her ability to go several kilometers in the chair and were able to eavesdrop, because it turns out that we speak French, she wasn't expecting that, uh, we were able to hear her bragging about the chair to her friends who she was able to go visit with them. And so for us, the real satisfaction is seeing the independence that having the mobility to move around on your own gives people to be able to go to work or school. Um, and it's that individual small impact that helps us kind of motivate ourselves to overcome the, the big institutional challenges to reaching impact of the world. So, I know you have, uh, your product actually would be after service also. So, do you have uh, any kind of input for that or uh, how do you see that problem? Yeah, so one of the, the issues that we saw with existing products is that when they would break, there would be no way to repair them. And so, when we designed this chair, we designed it entirely out of bicycle components that you can find throughout rural India. So all of the same service and repair that you would need to do on your bicycle is the same for this chair. Also, the entire frame is made out of steel, so it's very easy to repair should you know, anything happen to the frame. 
And so we don't have to worry as much about the service. We just need to instruct and train the people that are using the chair that, hey, this chain is bicycle chain. These wheels are bicycle wheels. If there is any issue, any village bicycle shop is able to repair. And this is something that we've seen consistently in the chairs in the field throughout India, as well as East Africa and Haiti, is that if issues have arisen, if there is a puncture, if there is a broken spoke, if there is issues like that, new bearings needed, um, they're able to repair it locally without really any instruction from us. I have a question for Mario. Have you approached, uh, you know, using a contract manufacturer, have you approached any bicycle manufacturers like the iCycle or somebody? Yeah. Uh, so all of the all of the bicycle parts on the chair are actually supplied wholesale from TI Cycles, um, and then one of the challenges of being a small hardware company is that it's hard to get manufacturers to take you seriously. And so even you know as a social enterprise shipping a thousand, we're like yeah that's awesome, uh, but many manufacturers ship one hundred thousand in a year. And so we would love to have GI Cycles or another large bike company make the entire thing, but you know we're too small for that just yet. So, um, any other questions from the audience before I kind of start getting to the concluding parts of the session? Uh, generally, all these designs might not be very complicated. Uh, if the world we have seen something is done, if it is selling it, then many other people will come, they will uh, make it and start selling it. In that case. How will you uh, how will you make this one as sustainable business or work for your team? Uh, see, uh, I'm I'm actually thinking maybe because it's not so terribly relevant to the topic as in terms of how he's growing the business. Maybe you could abstract it to a higher level in terms of uh, you know. Yeah. So from a social impact point of view, yeah. if other people were to copy the chair and make thousands of them that would increase our impact. That would be more people using the chair. That being said, I have experienced firsthand the difficulties of selling the chair and know that our position in the market and reputation will prevent other people from counterfeiting it. And so as social enterprises, you have to balance the goal of getting as many of your items out into the world as possible and doing so in a way that is ensures highest quality, ensures that you can stay in business to make improvements on the design. Uh, it's a balance that every company has to walk. So, again, getting talking on the solution space, right? what do we do about this challenge? You know, I can't talk of any other solution space that's probably more important than technology, right? And I think Mahathir should definitely agree, right? I mean, yes. just technology has just provided such a brilliant platform. So, can you guys just walk me to maybe you can start with your what, what do you see as a technology landscape? What are some new stuff that's coming out? What do you wish for? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, technology can and has played a very significant role in enabling and empowering the process of the center. why from its inception, has adapted the available technology and has worked innovatively using the to make a difference in the lives. Primarily in the space of education, in 1999, I had the good opportunity of going to the US. I saw visual impaired at least to the end of computer. So I needed to draw some computer software. DOS, which was already there in India, but was not very uh, liberally used. So we needed this really software. In all of our students, uh, initially we started higher education. So somebody in all of the different formats was standing and doing noise. So we made the Teams computer as a tool to enable. That all started as tool to use for education. It became very handy for in their future environment. They did not undergo another training. And even the environment space, some of them runs a video training and video ourselves. We run a in the video. More than 70% of the world for some process. So some of them practices what we talk. So we believe in inclusion, we believe in holistic so we have a whole range of programs which have intervention for persons with disabilities in the education environment and uh, sports culture. As uh, Shima said, we manage the Indian bank team with one world cup. So if you can take them to that high level, getting recognition is not a problem. So 
using technology, we have created really scale the organization process. 40% of the workforce in some other world is really applicable. So now we like innovating solutions using technology can open more doors at a bigger level. So, I am going to conclude this with one last question to everyone. So, starting with Mario and maybe working this side onwards. So, you know, you have, you have, you know, in, in, in your own way, all four of you have addressed this, this, this challenge in some way. If to, to leave the audience a little bit positive, you know, with something that they could, they could take away, what, what would be the one thing that you have done which they can maybe copy paste? Control C, Control B. What, what, would, what would it be? Um, when you're designing, if you have a technology focused enterprise and you're designing something, really listen to the people that you're designing it for. This is the fourth or fifth version of this chair. If we had launched with our first version, we would have failed. If we had launched with our second version, we would have failed a little more slowly. And likewise with the third version. We still, I don't think, have reached success, but we have something that is really fine-tuned to the needs of the people it is uh, being used by. So really listen to your users, and you'll develop a successful technology. Thank you.